so we're trying to use nanotechnology in new ways to prevent the use of chemicals that are often used to purify drinking water but have unavoidable side effects. So we think using nanotechnology can help purify water with fewer of those side effects. Welcome to Stories from the NNI. This series features voices from the U.S. National Nanotechnology Initiative. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. In honor of World Water Day, I had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Paul Westerhoff. Paul is the Deputy Director of the NSF-supported Nanosystems Engineering Research Center for Nano-Enabled Water Treatment Technologies, or NUT. He is also the Vice Dean for Research and Innovation in the School of Engineering at Arizona State University. Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Could you tell us a little bit about your work? Thanks, Lisa. So I'm really excited to be uh, talking about nanotechnology. So my work has kind of spanned from looking at uh, the risks of nanotechnology and our drinking water and rivers for our fish and other ecosystems to looking at how to detect these nanomaterials in rivers and drinking water. And over the last decade, our thinking has evolved a lot from initially kind of worrying and fearing that nanomaterials might be a risk, where now we're actually come almost full circle and we're looking at uh, ways in kind of the environmental area to use nanotechnology to safely clean water. So specifically, one of the things I'm real excited about is I'm the deputy director of an engineering research center that's funded by the National Science Foundation. It's called Newt, kind of like that slimy little green animal that has a membrane on its skin and water that can move across it. But our center, Newt, Nano-Enabled Water Treatment Technologies, aims to look at how to increase the amount of clean water that can be accessed anywhere in the world, or even in the United States for the 40 or 50 million people that live kind of off the water grid. We hear a lot about the power grid, but about 40 to 50 million people in the U.S. have private wells or other sources of water that aren't municipal water that meet uh, all the city and other requirements. So we're looking at developing nano-enabled modules or water treatment systems to bring clean water to these people who live off the water grid. And from there, we can translate that to people who live on the water grid but want higher quality water, as well as people around the world, whether it's emergency cases of water disruption or areas where they don't have the conventional water infrastructure. So we're trying to use nanotechnology in new ways to prevent the use of chemicals that are often used to purify drinking water but have unavoidable side effects. So we think using nanotechnology can help purify water with fewer of those side effects. Well, that's such an interesting concept. I never considered myself off the grid, but I do live in the country and we access water through our own well and not through a municipal system. So it's a really interesting concept. And I'm curious, could you give us a little bit more information about what mechanisms you're looking at with respect to using nanotechnology to provide higher quality water? Nanotechnology opens up kind of new realms of how you can treat water. And when we say treating water, there's potentially chemicals in the water, potentially biological organisms that can cause intestinal problems that are in water. And this is in groundwater, river water, ocean water, even you know water vapor in the air. So what we're trying to do is to take nanoparticles, attach them on to different types of surfaces, maybe carbon surfaces, you know, like activated carbon or charcoal, onto glass, onto polymers, in different configurations where then we can stimulate them with light, microwaves, or other forms of energy to have them selectively remove pollutants from water. Uh, this is again in contrast to having to put chemicals into water. And we look at organic or pollutants from things like herbicides and pesticides if you live near agriculture, to things like pharmaceuticals that could get into our water supplies, all the way to things like nitrate, which is the most prevalent groundwater contaminant in the US, Europe, and China. But all these have these chemicals that can occur in water that have real problems, and you know, they're difficult to treat by using uh, commercial technology today, especially at smaller scale. So as we try to look at the water system of the future, it might be less centralized 
water treatment that puts out very high quality water for everything that we need, everything from toilets to drinking water, where it's more localized in apartment buildings, we might be able to polish the water with these types of nano enabled devices. So again, whether you're off the water grid or have this need to polish water, using nanotechnology and these various forms of implementing energy, light, microwaves and other, to activate the nanoparticles to clean them is a real opportunity, we think. And so I can give a specific example if you'd like. Well, sure. And I, I'm also curious, you talk about using the sources to activate the nanoparticles that, that will then react with these biological organisms or, or other chemicals that might be found in the water. Are you also using nanotechnology as, as filters or membranes, more of a, a mechanical separation as well? Yeah, so uh, I'll give you a few examples. We're really trying to take advantage of more their unique optical, magnetic, photonic properties rather than putting a bunch of nanoparticles into water, kind of like fairy dust. Mm -hmm. uh, they might do wonderful things, but then you have to get the fairy dust out. And so we think instead of sprinkling nanoparticles into water and hope you remove 100% of them, what we try to do is to, you know, and one of the guiding questions in our engineering research centers how do you attach nanoparticles onto surfaces to prevent their release into your drinking water so you don't drink the nanoparticle, but also to either enhance, preferably to enhance its performance to remove pollutants. So you mentioned membranes, and so membranes are, are commonly uh, used. Some people have what's called a low pressure reverse osmosis system under their sink to remove calcium, sodium, and other ions in the water. And uh, those are pretty inefficient. Uh, only about 30% of the water that goes in actually comes out of the tap. So by putting nanoparticles on there, one particular part of, type of nanoparticle that we put on reverse osmosis membranes are silver nanoparticles. And the silver nanoparticles slowly dissolve and prevent biofilms from growing on the membranes. The reason why that's important is that those biofilms actually decrease the amount of water that goes through the membrane. So over the course of a few months, the efficiency of that reverse osmosis system might go from just producing three gallons of water out of every 10 to less than one gallon of water out of every 10 that comes in. So we can make existing systems like that RO work better. And that's at the, you know, at your household scale. We also can do that at a large industrial scale where they're using reverse osmosis for things like desalination. So it's really how to make some systems better. Uh, within our center, we have some really creative people our center involves folks from where I am at Arizona State University, Rice University, University of Texas El Paso, and Yale. And across our whole center, a concept that's developed is where we put nanoparticles on the surface of distillation membranes, and then the energy you apply is sunlight. That sunlight superheats the nanoparticles on the surface, creates a, a, a temperature gradient across the membrane, and actually water vapor moves across the membrane leaves behind the salt. So you don't plug this in anywhere. It's totally operated by the sun and it'll desalinate water. So that's an example of how we integrate nanoparticles into membranes. We have a lot of other types of membranes that we're integrating different particles uh, into. We have other ones that we can put electrical currents through the membranes with nanoparticles on them to destroy pollutants or destroy you know, microbial constituents in water. So that's one example. Oh, I just wanted to ask you some questions about that example. What a great example, using the sunlight to superheat and, and to provide, it sounds like, the, the energy to, to have the water vapor moving across this membrane. Is that, what, what scale is that possible? I mean, is that something that, that you would use in a, in a remote environment to, to purify water? Is that something that, that you see as a, a scalable mechanism for desalination? Right. So Newt, as a center really led by uh, Naomi Hollis and Sheelin Lee at Rice University in Texas, the initial discovery was that uh, you could put nanoparticles into water, shine sunlight on them, and form steam. And then so what Newt has been able to do is to take that idea and actually turn it into a functional device. Again, this nano-enhanced membrane solar distillation system so right now it is intended for kind of a household scale, but the team at, at Rice University and some of uh, our industrial partners in 
uh, Newt have teamed up and they've written an SBIR proposal. They're looking at applications, not only at kind of the household point of use scale in developing countries, whether it's desalinating water if you're near the ocean, but really it's also providing a, a positive barrier against salt and other microbial pollutants, uh, maybe in cisterns or in groundwater wells. And uh, the st one of the startup companies is actually looking at applications in the military for kind of uh, portable, low energy using water systems. But the concept is really appealing to a lot of folks. We also have the oil and gas industry as part of our center, and they produce uh, water uh, when drilling wells out in the middle of West Texas. Uh, they have a lot of sunlight, not a lot of power lines. And so this type of technology allows them to desalinate their water. So we think that there's a lot of applications. It's driven by the intensity of the sunlight that you have available. And we're looking at ways now to actually enhance that. Then across our center, we're looking at that as one type of a platform and understanding how to go all the way through kind of the product development up to about a technology readiness level three, where then commercial partners take it over and they have a whole host of different ideas that they want to take technology like that into. And it's an example where kind of a basic discovery of that nanoparticle superheat in the sun, you actually form a, a small shell around a nanoparticle with steam in it. And if you can use that in the right way in an engineered system, you can do things like purify water. Well, that's a very exciting example. And I'm also really thrilled to hear that there are mechanisms that have been developed and put into place that will transition these discoveries and in, in this research that you're doing into perhaps a system that I can use at my own house in the not too distant future. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us about the role of nanotechnology in purifying water on this World Water Day. Thanks for the opportunity. Stay tuned for the rest of my conversation with Paul Westerhoff as we discuss how working with different disciplines helps make one plus one far greater than two. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stories from the NNI. If you would like to learn more about nanotechnology, please visit www.nano.gov and check back here for more stories.